For the times that we will be together, I have three opportunities to speak to you. I want to focus on one passage for each of these three sessions, and in talking with Scott Brown about what would be most appropriate for this conference on the glory of God, some way, I can't remember how, but in one way or another, we settled on the last chapter in the Bible. So I want you to take your Bible and turn with me to Revelation chapter 22. And in these three sessions, I want us to look at this extraordinary uh, final chapter of the Bible that does put on display the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this session, I want to look at the first five verses, Lord willing. I want to begin by reading these five verses in Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. This is God's inspired and errant and infallible word. Beginning in verse 1, Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street on either side of the river was the tree of life bearing twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And His bondservants will serve Him. They will see His face. And his name will be on their foreheads, and there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need need of the light of a lamp, nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illumine them, and they will reign forever and ever. The theme of our conference is the glory of God. Of Christ. And there is no better place to behold the unveiled splendor of the glory of Jesus Christ than in this book of Revelation. In fact, the title of the book is The Revelation of Jesus Christ. It's in chapter 1, verse 1. And the title is not like the country preacher sometimes calls it Revelations plural. No, the formal title drawn from the first four and five words of the entire book is the revelation singular, and it's very important that we understand that it is singular because the book of Revelation is the unveiling of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, not as He once was veiled in the form of a bondservant, not as he once was as the carpenter from Galilee, not as he once was as the meek Messiah, but as he now is King of kings and Lord of lords, as he is now seated upon his throne with all sovereignty invested in him. And the key word in these first five, five verses is the word throne. You will see it in verse 1. You will see it in verse 3. As John records the throne of God, referring to the Father, and of the Lamb, referring to the Son. This throne is not necessarily a piece of furniture per se, though it may well be, But in reality, what we are to take from this is that it is a symbol of divine sovereignty by which Christ exercises supreme authority over the entirety of the created being. Everything in this passage revolves around the throne upon which Christ is presently seated. And everything in heaven finds its position 
in its proximity to the throne, whether it is before the throne, around the throne, under the throne. Everything in heaven revolves around the throne upon which Jesus Christ is seated. In this passage, the eternal celestial city, the new Jerusalem, which comes down as a bride out of heaven, is represented in these five verses as a beautiful garden. In fact, the word paradise means garden. And in this scene, paradise lost under Adam is now paradise regained under the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see here that we gain far more in Christ than we ever lost in Adam. And the superiority of the new Jerusalem and the new heavens and the new earth far surpasses the Garden of Eden. So tonight, I want us to look at these five verses, and as we walk through this, everything will revolve around the throne upon which Christ is seated. And the first thing that I want you to note in verse 1 is upon the throne. We will note that God and Christ are upon the throne. Please note in verse 1, he showed me a river of the, uh, of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from, here it is, the throne of God and of the Lamb. Please note there is only one throne with two occupants, two reigning sovereigns, perfectly united in their reign, with one purpose, with one will, with one administration, over one kingdom, jointly reigning together. And this throne is what first caught John's attention when a door was first opened in Revelation 4, and John was caught up into heaven. And if you would, turn back to Revelation 4, if you would, and I want to draw this to your attention which is really the centrality and the primacy of this throne in heaven. And in Revelation 4, and beginning in verse 1, after these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, like the sound of of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Verse 2, immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne. When John first enters into heaven, what captures his attention is not streets of gold. It is not gates of pearl. It is not walls with, with all of the precious gems. It's not what saints are there. It's not what loved ones are not there. What dominates John's vision as soon as he enters into heaven, number one on his list is a throne, which is the very apex and pinnacle of the entire created order and everything subservient to this throne. And a throne was standing in heaven, meaning it is fixed, it is stable, it can never be uh, moved away, and he notices that the throne is occupied, and one sitting on a throne. How important it was for John to see this and for this church at the end of the first century to come to understand this, because down here on the earth, the church is undergoing all kinds of persecution and affliction and tribulation, and it is, and Caesar is upon the throne, and the church is being buffeted, and how important it is to see that there is a throne in heaven above the throne on the earth, and that there is one seated, and the throne is occupied, and everything is under control according to the extraordinary providence 
of God. And in verse 3, there is a rainbow around the throne. And in verse 4, there are other thrones, subservient thrones, subsidiary thrones, 24 thrones that are lesser thrones with 24 elders sitting upon them as though there is responsibility being delegated to them under the sovereignty of this one throne. And in verse 5, out from the throne come flashes of, of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. There, there is a gathering storm in heaven that is reflective of the tribulation that is going on down on the earth. And there is, in verse 5, before the throne, fire burning, which are the seven spirits of, of God. And in verse 6, before the throne... There was something like a, a sea of glass-like crystal, and then in the center and around the throne, four living creatures, which literally means four living ones, four presence angels guarding access to this throne. And in verse 10, the 24 elders are falling down before the throne, and they are casting their crowns before the throne. Everything in chapter 4 revolves around the throne, upon the throne, in the throne, around the throne, under the throne, the very center of heaven is this throne. And in chapter 5, we see that one approaches this throne, who is the lion of the tribe of Judah, who is the lamb that was slain. And he takes the book as he approaches the throne. And in chapter 6, in verse 1, he will break open the book and he will become the executor of the eternal decree of God upon the earth. And he will exercise complete, total sovereignty over the entirety of of the universe, and as R.C. Sproul has said, there will not be one maverick molecule. Everything will exist to carry out his bidding. And as Martin Luther said, even the devil is God's devil to carry out God's higher purposes. So we've already been introduced to this throne. By the time we come to Revelation chapter 2, and it is in the very epicenter of heaven, it is in the place of preeminence in heaven, and there are two who are seated upon this one throne. It is God the Father, and it is the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, seated at the right hand of God the Father, upon this throne. So come back to Revelation 22, if you would. And we see why John, as he comes to the end of the book of Revelation, brings us back to where it started. As soon as he entered heaven in Revelation 4-2, he saw a throne. Everything revolving around the throne. And now as we come to the end of the book of Revelation, he returns back to the dominance of this throne. Now we will note that on the throne is God. It is God's throne, the throne of God. And it is the throne of the Lamb. Our conference is about the glory of Jesus Christ. And here we see the glory of Christ reigning in his supreme authority, surprisingly, as the Lamb. Now, there are four things just quickly to note about this. Number one, this stresses Christ's deity. 
because he is jointly reigning with God the Father. And we think of Psalm 110, verse 1, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. It is the Lord speaking to the Lord. It is God the Father to God the Son in an intertrinitarian conversation within the Godhead. It speaks to the fact that this lamb is co-equal with God. And the second, it certainly stresses not only Christ's deity, but Christ's sovereignty because he's on the throne. He's on the very same throne that God the Father is on. This is not one of the 24 lesser thrones that are subservient to the throne of God. Jesus is actually seated on this very same throne. And it is for us to understand that not only is he equal with God as he sits on the very same throne, but that all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto him. Matthew 28, 18. And third, we see stressed here Christ's humanity, is that he is represented as the Lamb, one who has entered the human race, one who has become like unto us yet without sin, one who would come to sacrificially lay down his life upon the cross. And we understand that Jesus had to assume sinless humanity in order to die because God cannot die. And if Jesus had come simply as truly God, he could have never died upon the cross because of the immortality of the divine nature. Uh, Jesus had to assume human nature in order to bear the curse for our sins, which is death. And then fourth, we see in this image of the Lamb, it stresses Christ's humility because He would be the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. He would be the Lamb who would be led to slaughter, yet open not His mouth. He would be the Lamb who would be slaughtered for our sins as He gave His life a ransom for many. What is dominant in heaven is the one who is upon the throne. We see it again in verse 3. You'll note in the middle of verse 3, and the throne of God and of the Lamb. And this speaks of their reign over all together. It says that this throne will be in heaven. It and the it refers to the new Jerusalem, and the fact that it is in it is also somewhat strange that in the midst of this paradise, in the midst of this beautiful garden as heaven is represented to us, there is this throne in the midst of the garden. It speaks of the primacy and the centrality of Christ's reign. The fact that it is in it, this word in can also be translated to designate a fixed position and it speaks to the stability and the durability and the eternality of this reign, that he will never be impeached and he will never be removed from this throne. Christ is upon this throne. He is presently there now at the right hand of the Father, and there he shall be throughout all of the ages to come. Now, second, I want you to note what is out from the throne. Here in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 2, we have seen who is on the throne. Now, I want you to note what is out from the throne. And John describes an unusual feature of this throne. There is a river that is flowing out of the throne. And so in verse 1, 
John records, and he, referring to the guiding angel who has given this tour of, of heaven, showed me, referring to John, a river, a mighty surging river, a flowing river, not a creek, not a stream, not a trickle, but a powerful river. And in this river, it says, a river of the water of life, meaning it is living water that gives life. It is life-sustaining. It is life-refreshing. It is life-replenishing, and it is a constant flowing river that shall never cease to flow it shall forever flow, it will never run dry, and it is the abundant, supernatural fullness of life that is gushing out of the throne of God, and it is sustaining life of all who will drink of it. And this, li- this, this water of life is so extraordinary, he says here, clear as crystal, meaning it is without any pollutants, it is without any contaminants, it is 100% pure, it is totally clean, and it says in verse 1, it is coming from the throne. In reality, it is flowing from those who are seated on the throne, it is from God the Father and from the Lamb themselves. They are the exclusive source of life that is constantly supplying life for all those in heaven. It is in the Father and in the Son that we will live and move and have our being And Jesus is life, John 14, verse 7, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the bread of life. He possesses life. He creates life. He gives life, and He sustains life. And it is coming from the throne, everyone in heaven dependent upon this river of life for its existence It says in verse 1, it is coming from the throne of God and from the Lamb. From this throne, Jesus, in His glorified state, gives all that we will need throughout the ages to come. He gives to us the knowledge of the Father. He gives to us the fullness of life. He gives to us joy and happiness and bliss and love and peace, and He gives it to us in the fullness. This is what's coming out of the throne and in reality from those who are upon the throne. Now, notice third, what is near the throne. In verse 2, we read, in the middle of its street. And we are to understand that there is a main thoroughfare in heaven. There is a, a central avenue that provides access for those in heaven to the throne of God such that we have unhindered availability to come before the throne of grace in the middle of this street, the main thoroughfare through heaven on either side of the river, meaning on the left bank and on the right bank of the river, was the tree of life. How interesting. There is a a river of life that's giving 
life to all those in heaven, and now there is the tree of life, what we are to understand that this is abundance of life. This is fullness of life. That this is life that is overflowing. It is life that far exceeds any desire that we would ever have in heaven. And then he says, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every season. And what we are to understand here is the diversity and the variety and the beauty of what is being supplied us in heaven. One month, there is this fruit. The next month, this fruit. The next month, that fruit. And there is satisfaction. There is pleasure. In fact, it says, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Now, we are not to assume from this that there would be those who are sick in heaven who need to be healed. No, this word healed is the same Greek word from which we derive the English word therapeutic. That, in other words, the, these leaves from the tree of life provide for us in heaven what we are to understand is life that is reviving and refreshing and, and replenishing and, and invigorating, that in heaven we will never be empty or never depleted or never flat or, or never bored, but we will always be revitalized and, and invigorated and endued with the fullness of life that is flowing from this all-glorious Christ And the source is coming to us perpetually and eternally forever and ever, and we will never have want, and we will never have need, and all of our senses will be entirely fulfilled in the glory of this Christ upon His throne. And then fourth note, under the throne, in verse 3. He says, there will no longer be any curse. This points back to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve first sinned and God brought His severe judgment upon the first couple but upon the entire human race and upon the entire created order such that the Garden of Eden was turned into a wilderness and turned into a barren desert. And because of the curse, the the ground would yield thorns and thistles, and man would work by the sweat of his brow, and life would be hard and filled with suffering and sorrow and sickness and loss and death and, and devastation and spiritual warfare. And in paradise loss, there would be droughts and famines and earthquakes and hurricanes and tornadoes and floods and tsunamis, and there would be enmity between man and the animals, and there would be enmity between the animals and and other animals, and this world would become a a war zone as a result of, of the curse. But now in heaven... Under the throne, the the curse is removed and paradise lost that was turned into uh, uh, craters of, of, of devastation is now paradise regained, but only intensified increasingly all the more in its, in its beauty and the curse is removed. And there in heaven, there, there is a beautiful garden, and there is no death, and there is no mourning, and there is no crying. There is only stunning beauty and perfect peace and seamless harmony and flawless unity and unspeakable joy and abounding love and intimate fellowship and everything blossoming all around in a, in a perfect environment and in a perfect world. 
And all this under the throne of Christ as he's seated upon the throne. And also you will note in verse 3, around the throne. In verse 3 it says, And the Lamb of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His bondservants will serve Him. (laughs) This would be you and me. And bondservants is really not a good translation here. It's the Greek word doulos, which means a slave. And the difference between a bondservant and a slave, a bondservant is hired, a slave is bought and owned. And even in heaven, we will still be slaves of Christ. And those who have been bought with the, with the price of the blood of the Lamb that we heard in the last message. And so we will assume this humble posture around the throne, never becoming like our Redeemer or our Creator, but still redeemed slaves, and it will be our purpose to serve the glory of Christ. Yes, there will be responsibilities in heaven, and there will be duties in heaven, and we will find enormous satisfaction and pleasure in doing a job well done and fulfilling the God-given work ethic by which we will glorify God. We will not be passive in heaven. We, we will not be just laying on a cloud and having grapes dropped into our mouth by an angel. Uh, that, that would be an awful eternal existence. But we will, we will serve the Lord. We will put our, ourselves completely into this Uh, service of Christ, and it will be acts of worship by which we will glorify Him. And then note in verse 4, toward the throne, they, referring to His bondservants, will see His face. There's some discussion as to whether this is God the Father or God the Son. But it would be important for us to know that God the Father does not have a corporal body. He has an incorporal existence. God is spirit. He has revealed Himself in anthropomorphic terms, the hand of the Lord, the eyes of the Lord. But God doesn't have a hand and God doesn't have an arm and God doesn't have eyeballs. God is a spirit being. This is the uniqueness of the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ that one of the three members of the Godhead has actually assumed a human body and has entered into the human race and now has a face and now has hands and now has ears and eyes like you and I have. And I think the reference here, in fact, it's the antecedent, is referring to the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Just like 1 John Three verse 2 says, we shall behold Him, and we will see His face, and and this is the beatific vision. This is the, the highest of all of the blessings that we would ever know to be able to look into the face of the one who laid down His life for us at the cross. Ancient kings were rarely ever seen by their subjects. Uh, Citizens might go their entire life without ever seeing the face of their monarch or of their sovereign. Uh, Such a sight to look into the face of, of their king was reserved for only a privileged few. But here, all of his bondservants will see his face, and it speaks of our access to him and the intimacy of our relationship with this glorified Christ. And this will be the highest of all blessings, to so draw near to the throne of grace 
and to see upon the throne this one, the Lamb of God, and to have this intimate contact. And it says, in His name will be on their foreheads. It's a mark of ownership. When you put your name on something, it is that this object belongs to me. My name is on it. It doesn't belong to you, it belongs to me because my name is on it. It signifies possession and ownership. And His name will be on our foreheads, indelibly stamped, a mark of the fact that we have been bought with the blood of Christ, we have been purchased with precious blood, and we belong to Him, and His name is stamped on our forehead as those who have been bought and purchased by Him. It may also speak to the fact that He is our best thought by day and by night. And then look in verse 5, from the throne not out from the throne, but from the throne, verse 5, and there will no longer be any night. (laughs) There will be no more darkness. It will always be day. And there will be no sleeping because there will be no night. And now three negatives in a row, no longer any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp, whether they're inside or outside nor the light of the sun. God will just, in essence, lick His finger and snuff out the sun like you would snuff out a candle. And there will be no need for any secondary light or any artificial light, no need for a lamp, no need for the sun. Why? Because the Lord will illumine them. And there will be the outshining of the intrinsic glory of God that will beam brighter than 10,000 suns in the sky above, and it will come shining forth from the throne, and it will be the glory of the Father, but it will also be the glory of the Son, and the brightness of their intrinsic glory will illumine the entire galaxies and the universe There will be no need for any artificial light, whether inside or outside, so bright it will even shine through the walls. This is exactly what the disciples saw on the Mount of Transfiguration, that that veil was just pulled back for a moment, and the glory of Christ came shining forth from His face. And in Matthew 17 and verse 2, We read, he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as as light. Just for that moment, it was a a prelude and and a foreview of this coming day here when the very face of Jesus Christ would shine like the sun, shine brighter than the sun. And in Revelation 1 and verse 16, when John is on the island of Patmos and he hears a voice talking to him saying, write this, and he turns around and he sees the glorified Christ with with hair like white as wool and feet like burnished bronze and out of his mouth a sharp two-edged sword, we read that his face was like the sun shining in its strength. The glory of Christ. This is the unveiled glory of Christ that is often represented as bright, radiant light that shines forth at the end of The previous chapter, we read beginning in verse 20, 20, 23, and the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp 
is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, meaning the kings will bring their glory and lay it at the feet of Him whose glory is so great that it, it illumines the entire universe. They will lay their glory at His feet. Verse 25, in the daytime, for there will be no night there. Its gates will never be closed, and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations in it, and that is in order to give it and lay it before the Lord Jesus Christ. Theologians talk about two aspects of glory. There is intrinsic glory, and there is ascribed glory. And intrinsic glory is the sum and the substance of all that God is. Never increasing, never decreasing in this intrinsic glory from everlasting to everlasting, you are God and is the sum of all of the attributes of God, His holiness, His sovereignty, His righteousness, His mercy, His grace, His wrath, His power, His omniscience, all of that together is the the sum of His intrinsic glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Heaven and earth is full of His glory. And the more that we behold the intrinsic glory of God, and in this case, in the Son of God, who is fully God, truly God, we will ascribe glory to Christ. The more that we behold His intrinsic glory, the more we will ascribe glory to Him. We cannot give Him any intrinsic glory. I am who I am. We may only give to Him ascribed glory. And the more we behold the beauty of His perfections, the more we will rise up and ascribe honor and glory and power and dominion to Him. Finally, I would want you to see at the end of verse 5, and they, this is with the throne, and they will reign forever and ever. Really surrounding the throne are His bondservants. Now, those who will see His face in verse 4, those who will receive His name in verse 4, they will reign, they will share in the reign of the Lamb in a submissive way. And it says forever and ever, meaning literally ages to the ages without end. This is what Paul taught in 2 Timothy 2.12, if we endure with Him, we will reign with Him. And Jesus said in Matthew 19, verse 28, you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on His glorious throne, you shall also sit upon twelve thrones. And in Luke 22, verse 30, you will sit on thrones. And in Mark 10, verse 37, Remember when James and John said, grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory, and Jesus did not deny that that possibility would be there for someone. He just said in verse 40, to sit on my right and to sit on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Now, we as His bondservants will be seated around Him and we will be in alignment with His reign perfectly, and there we will be forever and ever and ever beholding the glory of His face, shining brighter than the sun above, with His name stamped and etched upon us, worshiping Him and serving Him forever and ever. This is what we have that awaits us. This is why Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is even better. To to die is gain because 
I'm living for Christ here. I'm living for Christ here. I will live with Christ there. And I will have access to his throne. I trust that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if you do not know Christ as your Lord and Savior, it'll be the very opposite of this. You will be in a lake of fire and brimstone and suffer the torment of the damned forever and ever. But for those who put their faith and their trust exclusively in the Lord Jesus Christ and who turn away from their sin and who deny themselves and take up a cross and begin to follow Christ, we will be there in this perfect world that He has created. He said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you will be also. What a place he has created for us. But it's not the place, it's the person of Christ that draws our heart to heaven. It's not what's there, it's who's there. The glory of Jesus Christ. And you and I have never seen or have never beheld the sight that we will one day behold when we look into his face and we see his matchless, majestic, intrinsic glory shining like the sun and his garments like white, radiant. May you put your trust and your faith in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father, it's staggering. It's astonishing. It's bewildering. It is mind-boggling what awaits us in this land that is fairer than day, in this paradise, this garden with the river of life and the tree of life and the leaves for the healing of the nations. But more than that, the one who is upon the throne at the right hand of the Father who has laid down his life for us and is forever and ever recognized as the lamb who was slain from before the foundation of the world. May we forever glory and ascribe glory in this one who possesses all glory. We pray this in his matchless name. Amen.